Hello, good morning, good evening. Uh, welcome to another webinar from the Optical team. Uh, I'm Derek Shanks, Product Manager, and I've got another special guest with me today, Christian Grazier, uh, who's a distinguished engineer out of our site in Dandridge, Sweden. Um, we are going to pass it over to him shortly, but I'm going to jump in and just give a give a couple of um, introductory slides first. Uh, but if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please put them in through the chat um, and while they get to them during the presentation at the end uh, we will have time for Q&A or if we don't get to them then I'll get back to you um, after the after the meeting. Um, so without uh, further ado if I jump in here uh, today's topic Trimble Vision and Trimble Auto Lock in the SX10. Uh, I just wanted to start giving a brief history of uh, vision with Trimble. So we have been doing vision for a long time. Uh, ironically, it was actually in the Trimble GX scanner that we had the first uh, integrated camera uh, and also had real-time colorization in that scanner. Uh, and from there, we moved in and had a calibrated first calibrated camera in a total station with the Trimble VX coming out in 2007. Uh, moving on, still on the S-Series platform, we had the first HDR camera uh, integration into a total station. 2016, we had integration of HDR cameras into our TX series, so the TX6, TX8. Uh, and then what we're all here to, to talk about today, 2016, we had the next generation of Trimble Vision in the SX10, being the uh, the blind telescope with cameras as well as a plummet camera. Uh, so we have been doing Vision for a while, um, and it is getting just better and better. Uh, the other key topic today being... Trimble auto lock. So I just wanted to highlight a couple of a key differences. So we are going to talk on the SX10 uh, behind the scenes and, and how to get the most out of your instrument. But just to, to jump back one uh, on the Trimble S series, it's a, an analog tracker. Uh, so really um, coarse uh, sensor just with four four quadrants uh, or with the addition of fine lock options you can use the, the inner quadrant um, and that works with our active target portfolio so the MT1000 AT360 and the target ID under the 360 prism so that's what we had for a long time what a lot of you know uh, but then the Trimble S610 uh, it's a bit of a different ball game so we moved from the analog tracker to a camera tracker uh, and that means that it's not compatible with active targets. Um, however, it does mean that we don't need a special mode for fine lock, um, and Christian's going to go into a lot of detail there, uh, explaining how that all works. Um, and the other key thing is that we can now have a coaxial tracker receiver, so because uh, we don't have a telescope through it, we can put the, the tracker there, um, which provides improved stability and performance um, of our tracking system. Uh, we also needed to do uh, this technology shift to accommodate what we uh, what we needed to get the scanning functionality uh, in with the cameras. Uh, but that's just a real brief background. Uh, I'm now going to pass it over to Christian, uh, who's going to be with you for the next uh, 40 minutes or so. But um, yeah, I'll be here able to answer questions um, and bring them up to Christian if we if it's relevant. Uh, and yeah, sit back, enjoy. Uh, and I will just now change the presenter over to Christian. Uh -huh. Show my screen. Let's pin this one here. Okay. Um, and Christian, I'd, it'd be good if you uh, give yourself a bit of an introduction, but I guess in, in short, while you're getting your screen up, uh, a long time. There we go. I'll leave it to you. Is this visible now? Yep, we can see your screen. Thank you. So quick introduction. Thank you, everybody listening today. Um, I'm working with Trimble since 1997 and first in the, as a manager of the lab in Jena in Germany. And since 2004, I'm technical leader in Danderyd in Sweden. I need to move, I think, this one. Can't move that. Okay. And um, need to switch on something as well. Okay, so very quick, going back to what is an SX10? Total station, scanner, or both? And uh, as a station, typically very accurate, very accurate aiming, and it's used to selectively capture discrete 3D points. I believe you all know that. And what is the scanner? 
yeah, it's to get with speed, many, many measurements, and it needs a fast B movement. And finally, it measures a dense grid of points over a target area. So the result is a 3D point cloud. So the SX10 is actually both. It's a true laser scanner with 26.6 K points per second. And it has a range of 600 meters, a distance noise of 1.5 millimeters, and the full dome scan with 10 mega points is done in 12 minutes. So it's a real scan. But on the other hand, it's also a high end total station. And that's also part of that what I'm um, concentrating today on. It has one arc second angle accuracy. It has a distance meter with total station quality of one millimeter and one ppm accuracy to prism. It has a, a advanced target tracking to follow prisms and it has a highly calibrated cameras inside. So now we are into the today's agenda. I'm going to talk about the vision system and the outer lock target tracker. And the vision system um, includes also a plummet camera and a target illumination light. The optical implementation in telescope is seen here. I'm concentrating on the telecamera, which receives the light here through a lens, prism, and focusing lens down here onto the camera sensor. The tracker receives the light in the same coaxial way, focused down to another camera, which is our tracker. Additionally, we have down here two cameras that are used for wider field of view. We're coming to that later. So that's the vision system from Trimble. It's fully integrated and a calibrated camera system. It's used for the instrument operation, for documentation purposes, and for measurement purposes. And since this is a scanner, also for colorization of the point clouds for sure. It has got the coaxial telecamera going out through the center of the big eye. It has a primary camera with in average medium field of view, the overview camera with wide angle field of view, and a plummet camera in the bottom. The visual aiming is an important point for the surveyor. Traditionally, the eye behind the ocular, looking through the telescope, observing the hair cross and getting the target you want to aim to into the right, on the right spot. It's very similar, but still a little bit different. You have no eyepiece, but you get your live video feed on your tablet. And with help of the zoom, you can actually see it very convenient what you want to aim to. You've got a digital hair cross, which is overlaid. And that you by just click on the object you want to point at, and it goes to that spot. And then you can measure. The camera inside experiences as one camera, even so it's three in physics. It has one, it's experienced as with eight levels. It has a field of view of from 57 degree of the wide angle camera down to 0.65 degrees field of view. That is an 84 times zoom. Then we have zoom level seven and eight, which is digital zoom to make the image larger, to be easier to see on the screen. Here another example of the zoom. That's an original image from the SX10 when you store it with Trimble Access, and the object is at 190 meters. That's how it looks like in Trimble Access, in the finest physical zoom level six. And now I'm zooming into that detail here just did a screenshot. 
where one pixel of the camera is one pixel on the screen. You can actually see the screen pixels here. In this, you get you see the hair cross, and the middle part of the hair cross, that's actually the laser spot. And with that one, you can actually very accurately aim small objects, even at long distances, to get a feel, feeling on what is one pixel. It's roughly one millimeter at 50 meters distance. So at 190 meters, one pixel is four millimeters. The digital hair cross is exactly where the EDM points. So the middle here, and when you click, the instrument turns to that and measures and adjusts the focus of the telecamera. So this automatic crosshair overlay calculation, which is done in the background, um, depends on which camera is active, what is the distance to the target, and also sensor data, we're reading temperature inside the instrument, for example. And it depends for sure on calibration data in our production and maybe your user calibration as well. So digital crosshair um, is distance dependent, especially on the overview and primary camera, which are pointing parallel out from the center. This is a kind of a parallax. The overlaid crosshair position depends on the distance to the object. Here we have the EDM middle, and that's the camera little offset. At distance one, the ray on the camera is up here. So the instrument automatically moves the crosshair to this spot. On distance two, it's here, and it moves the crosshair to the right position. We can do that since the EDM is always on. Further, we have temperature compensated optics um, and high quality glass optics, which is optimized for stability over time and temperature. The telecamera module and the primary and over overview camera down here. Remaining temperature influences are then calibrated in our calibration station in production. Not only temperature is here called calibrated, but also lens distortion, the lens geometry, the outer focus, and all that on different temperatures. We do that for each instrument individually at minus 20, plus 20 Celsius and plus 50 Celsius. We do then finally a color calibration to reduce the light fall off effect of lenses and to make the color look uniform. That's the result after color calibration in production. The aiming using the telecamera in SX10 is able to have the same precision as previously. So you can do in the zoom level six very fine aiming and uh, level eight, one pixel is actually one arc second. User tests have shown to have the same aiming precision as the S7 total station. And again, you see here in the center, the center cross matches with the distance meter size. After calibration of the camera, measurements in the image are possible in TBC, for example. And here I'm overlaying on a real camera image what is the calibration error from our production. So here are these errors. At this location, the error is that large, and that is one pixel. So this is exaggerated a thousand times. The primary camera has one pixel accuracy at 50 meters, the most accurate one. Here you see a panorama taken with the overview camera in TBC and use its viewed in TBC here. 
Can you see the image boundaries here? Barely, because they're not enabled, but that's actually the boundaries of the images which are set together in TBC. I'm going into the camera settings now. The camera has settings for white balance and that helps the system um, to interpret the scene. So if you select auto, it tries to make the best out of it. And it does not always is the best in auto because it might misinterpret the scene. If it's a very orange uh, background, it might mean it's a um, warm um, indoors light. But auto is default and working in the most cases. Um, overcast means outdoors overcast at daytime. Daylight is at a sunny day. And incandescent is indoors warm light. Here we have examples where the auto and the manual uh, white balance uh, differs. And the manual for daylight can be a really better outdoors. But the auto does a good job. It's indoors auto, and that's indoors uh, manual set to incandescent. You get typically a little better color saturation in manual mode. Another setting is the spot exposure setting. That's especially important when the tar target is brighter or darker than the rest of the image. And here in the middle is the target it's actually brighter than the rest. And um, without spot exposure, it's barely possible to see the car railing here. But setting it to um, spot exposure, a small SE um, is visible in the hair cross. Then it takes this small area of the big image to calculate the exposure time. And then you see all the details nicely exposed. We have a fourth camera, which is in the bottom of the instrument. You see here, that's a plummet camera. It goes through the center hole, and it's the purpose is to look to the ground mark. And uh, yeah, the resolution is good, and you can see details such as uh, around 0.2 millimeters on the ground. It's very accurate and stable and it gives you an easy access to the uh, uh, ground mark. A further feature of the cameras is the target illumination. That is a scene um, seen by the camera when the target illumination is off. And uh, it might be difficult to find where are the prisons which you wanted to aim. Maybe your colleague has set them up and you've got only a map and where are they? Where are those prisms? Switching on the target illumination, you actually see one prism here, one prism there, closer one by here and there. So this helps actually to find and select the right target, especially when the surrounding work. So when you are done and know everything about the camera, you know, may want to know maybe in the field, how can I trust the cameras in field? How can I do the in-field check of the cameras? And it's easy as one, two, three, as my colleague Torsten uh, showed last year on Dimensions, these slides. Um, aim the target in phase one, switch phase, and check how much it uh, deviates in phase two. In this example, it's actually five pixels. And in that case, yeah, maybe you should do a user calibration, but how to do that? We optimized that field calibration of the camera center point. And how is it working? I'm going to show now. So the field camera calibration uses a kind of a template matching algorithm. What is that? Actually, a template is cut out from an image. 
and then we try to find where this template is located in instrument phase one and phase two in the images. So uh, this algorithm looks computer vision algorithms and can find it for you. So you don't have to click into the details. And uh, here I show you how is it working in the instrument. We take a series of pictures in phase one and uh, we actually check if leaves are in the images and something is moving, we would detect that and say it's not a stable target. That's not good for calibration use. So we select a small area around the EDM beam and uh, taking pictures from that. So we take pictures in phase two, rotate it back internally and try to match that pixels to the images from phase one. And then we get actually a strength of match value for each of those pictures. And the best matching position phase two is calculated in pixels. So the offset between images from phase one and phase two images in phase one is determined. And this little del delta then is the collimation area, which is um, applied to the uh, camera center. What is needed that this works? Actually, we need features because the algorithm need to find something in the images. So well, would not work. But what is working? Would that work? Yeah, if you select it here, hmm, not so good. It's a linear feature because the camera is um, an area. It needs actually features in two directions. So that's a good feature. That would work perfect. The plummet camera has the same principle and it needs in the same way 2D features. It could be even that um, rough features would work perfect and it does not need to be um, very leveled to work. But we have some um, limitation here as well. It should be no depth difference in that small area when you do the calibration. So phase one would look like that, add some depths, and phase two like that here. That's because of the parallax. The images would look very different, and the algorithm cannot uh, make a calibration on that. On that. So the so suggestion is to have more flat depth in the um, target for the calibration. If you have questions to that, come back to that later. Now I'm moving on to the Outlook system. The SX10 Outlook system does not inherit the S-series tracker. Actually, it was impossible to combine the optical setup which is needed for the scanning beam deflection with the tracker which we have in the S series. So we moved on with technology to camera sensors and those have improved greatly in recent years. And the available computation power needed for a good tracker performance and also for smart decisions, which is a good target, which is not a target, are now available. So how does now our tracker find and tracks a prism. So first we're sending out with this little prism, the laser beam onto the target. And uh, yeah, looking back from the instrument to the target, we have some sunglasses. We call it narrow band pass filter. And then we're using a kind of a difference image. So one image was on and one was off of the laser and again generating the differences. We have an intelligent target detector that does not view and look at um, reflex west signs. It looks only at the prism. I'm going to show you more about that. And it does even suppress false targets that might look like that. Headlights, of course. 
It has a predictive tracking, which also is present from the S series. And it has a fast target search. So again here, that's the movable um, tracker transmitter in the middle. It needs to be moved out. You have seen that while the scanning is um, operating in total station mode, it's in the center. So now something about the sunglasses, which we need. The solar spectrum is very, very, very wide. It has a lot of light in the visible area, but also infrared light. How should we be able to see when 1000 watt comes down to Earth from the sun, the little laser, which is 1 million times um, lower in power? What we do is we use a camera chip that sees only a portion. We have then a very special camera filter that cuts out all the rest, and we are looking only at the specific wavelength. This is a filter for special Trimble design. So that's our sunglasses. Then we have a second effect is we illuminating the target, and getting a picture back, we're seeing the target here. But then we take a second picture without illumination and we do subtraction. Now it's more clear. And this little blob can then very accurate um, be evaluated what, where is the center of this blob and how does it behave. We do that actually with 100 frames per second, which allows a very fast uh, tracking speed. So let's now look how the tracker detects the target. The field of view of the tracker is very similar to that of the telecamera. Up here, you see a field of view of, of the telecamera. And down here, I have overlaid images from the tracker. Actually, a little later, you see videos, both on telecamera and trackers, which is in the special R&D mode recorded. So the tracker blob is detected and we're doing a center of gravity for that. And we are relating the size, the shape and the motion of the target. And then that target that is most likely to be your target, that one is tracked. So what can be false targets? Other reflectors, road signs, reflective rests, but also quickly moving bright objects. First point, false target. So that's, you see here one target that's on the rod and the other that's a target which is in the background. And you see the tracker detects both. And uh, the camera tracker actually has an inherent um, fine lock. So it's no problem to move very close by. You're going to see now a video which is repeated to. Let's see how full it starts here. And you see how the tracker keeps lock on the right prism. And you see how close by the prism goes the other one. So it's actually no, no problem to have prisms close by anymore. Okay, let's go on to the next step. I've showed this picture earlier, road signs in the background on long distance, no problem. Even if the road signs are large, the reflex coming from the prism is very strong and the small pixels read only the power from the prison. The power coming from this big sign is smeared out on the many pixels of the tracker. And you're going to see that in the kind of a video again. He's walking even behind that target and the predictive tracking um, follows nicely. 
second time here. Now I've actually stored one picture because it went so fast. When the target is behind the uh, street sign, the tracker sees actually a little bit of the street sign, but it can actually distinguish that from the real tracker. So it's not reacting, not failing. Another situation which uh, could be a problem is headlights. Since the car is moving while we're doing the differential images, the car headlight changes. And we're going to see that what happens. It looks like it's always on the uh, um, prison. Have you seen anything in the in the video right on the right side? Let's take a still which one is stored at this situation here. You see the headlight, which is strong, and since it's an um, infrared source in the car headlight, it's been seen by our tracker, but it's a different shape. It's this little bit different image of the movement. And it's just um, the track is not reacting on that. Now we're doing similar things on the long distance. And here you see very strong sun reflexes, and the car is moving. You see that here. And uh, it's, it's not disturbed, even that's in the field of view. The uh, tracker is uh, so sensitive that this is stronger than the um, strong sun reflexes from the car here. I'm going to show you now a little video on predictive tracking. So he's walking behind the uh, um, sign pole and it's following and now it's going behind uh, the tree and it continues with the previous um, speed. So it just continues in the same way. And actually you can do settings, how long it would, oh, once more. Okay, here comes the setting. You can do a setting for the predictive tracking time, and you can set it to three seconds, depending on your disturbance in the field of view, or five seconds. Um, but these are uh, good values. So if it would not be visible, the uh, target after this time, the instrument um, would point back where it was left off. And you could go back. Or you could switch on the auto search, and you can define here the search range. Now I'm going to show how automatic search looks like. On the left side, the teller image. On the right side, you see what the tracker sees. And now he's going behind leaves, and then, oh, he should have higher target so it was lost and was outside the predictive time searching goes around and sees a lot of um, other reflexes but it finds out that those reflexes are not a prism and it hunts back to the original position where it loses lock so if you see that it loses lock trim black says tells you target lost just stay where you are, raise your prison, and maybe type in your new, not maybe, you should type in the new instrument height, the target height, and then it will lock on again. Here are the search window settings. So to summarize on that here, 
we did significant improvements in passive tracking in the SX10. It now distinguishes between targets very close together. It's not sensitive to reflective wests or road signs. The tracker is more intelligent of tracking targets in areas with many prisms, like FindLock, or even better. A platform, the new tracker is a platform for future with enormous potential for improvements. Improvements in camera sensors, but even more intelligent algorithms. So for normal use, no active targets are needed with the SX10. And with that, I am done so far with my presentation, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Yeah, we've got a couple coming in here, Christian. Um, the first one we'll start with. Um, so we talked about how there's eight different um, zoom levels in the field software, um, and just wondering, it's, so it's up to zoom level six, that's optical. Do you want to just talk to the, the optical versus digital zoom there for a second? Okay. Yeah, what does optical zoom level means? We have three different cameras which have different optics. That's really optical. And uh, in the telecamera, when we go into the other zoom levels, we actually cut out the center part of our five megapixel center sensor and uh, displaying that as a video stream. And that's also the reason when you press store image that you get different image sizes. So if you press store image in uh, zoom level one, you get a five megapixel image. But if you do that in zoom level two or in zoom level six, you get a smaller image, which is not five megapixels. That's not a digital zoom, that's physical zooming into the sensor. Seven and eight, that's actually zoom levels, which we interpolate the pixels to show them larger on the screen. Otherwise, you would have difficulty to point with your finger or with your pen on the right location to aim accurately. And you could also use the arrow keys to aim accurately, since one arrow key step maybe is then one arc second in the zoom level eight. Cool. Um, and then there's a question around which which prism is best to use um, with the SX10. So um, as always, a, a Travis prism is, you know, single glass prism is going to give the most accurate measurement. Um, however, for general topo work, of course, the 360 prisms are going to be the best because then you don't have to worry about orientating towards the instrument, but you do lose a wee bit of accuracy. Um, I don't know if you've got anything else to add on which prisms work best with the SX10, uh, Christian? Yeah, I think you said actually what's the case. Uh, most accurate you get it um, on the um, traverse prism um, and single prisms. Um, actually, our algorithms are looking into the uh, 360 degree prism to get the best of the center of gravity, um, which makes that accurate. And uh, if you're out and uh, with a 360 degree prism and you want to be very accurate, you actually could turn one prism towards the instrument. Then the, in the accuracy is not only two millimeters on the prism could go down to one millimeter. Um, and then there's a few questions um, all around sort of the same topic that I'm going to try and answer, uh, but then I'll let you, Christian, add anything at the end um, around detecting multiple prisms or locking onto different prisms. So once once you're locked onto a target and moving around with it, if that target never gets obscured, then the tracker is going to be able to continually track that target. So that's where Christian was showing, you know, car headlights or other targets can come into the field of view of the tracker, but it won't lock onto them because it can track and maintain 
the original target that it's locked onto. Where you'll find it locked onto a different one um, is when if something obscures your original target, then it will look for any other reflection in the uh, in the tracker sensor. And so if it sees something else, it'll turn and lock onto that. But so if you yeah, if your target that you're currently tracked gets obscured, then that's when it will look for something else. Uh, but if it never misses uh, locking onto that, then other things can come and go from the tracker sensor, but it's going to be able to distinguish from that. Yeah, it's completely right. And there I have a, um, a trick. When we measure through heavy traffic, actually it's good to switch off the auto search. When you see, oh, there's a lorry coming and blocking for five seconds, just stand still and let the lorry go and it will lock directly after the lorry is passed in the field of view. So the search should be switched off in such um, busy cases. And then there's also a question around uh, reflective targets, black and white targets. Uh, so with reflectives and black and whites and all that, we use, um, you need to use DR mode to measure to. So there's no uh, one specific target that we recommend using for reflectors or um, black and whites. Uh, it's just all done through DR mode pointing through the camera system. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add on that one, Christian. Will I have a look at a couple more questions that have just yeah, come in? If you want to aim accurately to the um, reflex sheet targets, the line of the reflex sheet might be a little thin for the telecamera. So actually, when you have to point on a reflex sheet on 100 meters, you should actually make the line, the middle, thicker. But you can see that with the uh, telecamera. And that would help. So um, a five millimeter line at 100 meters is perfect to be seen. Uh, and then still on the, the prism uh, track, a question around any issues tracking peanut prisms. Uh, so it's just a case of if it's if the tracker can get a if the tracker sensor can get a reflection from the prism, it's going to be able to lock onto it, correct? Yeah. And the range might be limited then, since the signal is smaller from a small prism. And that's because the bigger the prism, the more light it can send back to the tracker uh, from where it comes, whereas the smaller prism, it'll uh, not be as reflective, so to speak. Yes, that's right. And there's another parameter, uh, which is the quality of the glass prisms. If you really need the six to 800 meter range, you should have 50 millimeters prism of the really best quality which you can get. So not thinking, okay, it's a 50 millimeters prism, um, it's cheap, it will work. No, it needs to be really good, the traverse prism from Tremble. And then one other one here, just talking about how the crosshairs displayed in the video. Um, so can you just talk to how the crosshairs calibrated in relation to the cameras? Yeah, I went into that during the presentation. So the, the crosshair um, is calibrated in production here um, for all the influences that could, um, um, could occur. The crosshair is always where the EDM is. In our production, the EDM sets the measurement beam. Yeah, that's where your distance is measured. And uh, we see in our production the distance meter beam. And uh, we see as well the hair cross, and we can set this accordingly. Also, for temperature variations, we do that calibration and so on. Um, that means that hair cross is going to be digitally overlaid. Was that the question, or is it a different question in the background? Yeah, no, that, that was good. Um, and then if you want to, Christian, pass the, the presentation back to me uh, in that panel on the right. I've just got a couple of uh, wrap-up slides I'd like to show. Not sure how to do that. 
Um, click to stop screen sharing. Now I stop the screen sharing. Okay, and then you want to have the presentation, right? Yeah. Yeah. I ah, there we go. Perfect. Yep. Um, so I'll jump into this one here. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight uh, that on um, on our geospatial.trimble.com webpage, there is a whole lot of uh, resources available for you, and in particular on the SX10. Um, if you go to the SX10 page and then under downloads, uh, there's a whole bunch of bulletins, um, info sheets that we've put together on a lot of the topics that we've covered today, such as the plummet camera, the till light, uh, an infield calibration guide that goes into step by step on how to do the um, camera calibration that Christian talked about. Um, and also, I just want to highlight that a new firmware version uh, is available uh, for the SX10 that was released uh, a couple of days ago. So, hot off the press, um, S2.2.25 available through Trimble Installation Manager. Uh, the feature of this firmware release is that you can now change the Wi Fi channel selection um, if you have Trimble Access 2019. Uh, or newer, so that allows you to choose between 1, 6 and 11 for the channel uh, that the Wi-Fi will connect on, so that can be helpful in congested environments uh, using your SX10 to switch channel um, if one's using uh, doesn't have as much traffic on it, uh, also if you're operating two SX10s on a site uh, then you would want to uh, you would get improved functionality by having them on separate channels. Um, but yeah, do check out the, the download section um, and also make sure your, your S16 is running the latest firmware uh, for all the best features. I uh, also just wanted to highlight a um, on our webpage, um, geospatial.trimble.com, if you go forward slash accessories, we'll take you um, to the slide on the left where we have now all our GNSS, our optical and our scanning accessories uh, and controller accessories are coming very, very soon. Um, so here on the right, you can see the different different tabs um, showing all the different you know prisms we have, the tri we have. Um, so you can see all the all the um, accessories we have to go with our different instruments um, all there on our web page. Uh, also, just want to highlight the resource center. So on the main geospatial.trimble.com page, on the resource center at the top, you'll see um, lots of different good things, but there's and two I want to highlight is both a blog and the webinars. So we did a webinar on uh, the scanning and the EDM principles in the SX10, so that's up there on webinars. This one will be available there shortly, uh, this recording, so you can download and watch it again or send it to your friends. Um, and also a blog that has a lot of good uh, tips and information coming out also um, new products and stories so yeah i encourage you to go and check that out uh one i think it's the last slide i have uh we now have the ability for you to request a demo um, in particular on the scanning side so if you go to trimble.com forward slash scan dash demo uh, you will get to the page on your right uh, where you can fill out your name address your email um select what you're interested in um, a demo on, and then we will make sure that happens. Um, alternative, alternatively, uh, just through the main website, through products and solutions, choose laser scanning, and then you've got the big request a demo button. Um, so that's also there uh, to, just to help you make sure that you are seeing and getting all the best out of our equipment. Uh, and I think, that's what I had. So I'll just have a quick check to check that there's no new questions uh, that have come in. Um, I know there's a couple that I'll get to offline. Um, no, that's good. So uh, Christian, thank you very much for your time. Thank you everyone for joining. Uh, stay tuned for another optical uh, webinar and Hope you have a great day and thank you very much for calling in. Thank you. Bye-bye.